Great. Well, I'm really happy to be back in Croatia, in Zagreb, and at MoMA. So I have to thank you for the, the invitation. And I also have to thank you all for coming out um, tonight on this kind of beautiful uh, summer evening. Uh, as compensation, I guess I could, um, maybe we can recall this argument of Michel Foucault. I think to, to kind of roughly paraphrase, Foucault uh, argued, once said that um, for us moderns, the best pleasure is speaking about pleasure. So perhaps um, what you're going to hear tonight is, is the most enjoyable thing you could be doing right now. So I will say a few words. Um, I'll just try to say a few words about the book, so what I was trying to accomplish and like the main lines of argument. But I'll also try to keep it quite brief because I would like to engage or I'd like this even to be more kind of conversation. So with Petar and Anta and then with the general audience if you have questions and so forth. So uh, what is this book about? I think there are sort of four different um, themes or four different problem areas that are somehow uh, uh, connected in this work. And first and foremost, so the title of the book, The Trouble with Pleasure, Deleuze and Psychoanalysis, it's a book about the concept of pleasure. And the basic thesis that I explore is that our relationship to pleasure is a very complex, difficult, even uh, contradictory and conflictual one. It's not as a certain kind of moral uh, psychology would have it that simply pleasure is good and pain is bad or that human beings uh, try to maximize their pleasure and avoid pain. In fact, I think even without being a Freudian, uh, uh, one could have the observation uh, that human beings, if anything, are kind of astoundingly ingenious at organizing their own uh, unhappiness or organizing their own discontent. And that humans are very creative at doing this. They find all sorts of interesting ways to sabotage their own desires. And I think that's the kind of starting point for what I would call a modern uh, moral psychology as opposed to a classical one. Uh, Nietzsche has a wonderful line about this when he says, uh, man does not seek pleasure, only the Englishman does. Um, I think we would probably, if you look at like current events in Europe, and in England, we would probably even have to revise this statement because maybe the English are not so kind of hard-headed and pragmatic as they're made out to be. But this is kind of Nietzsche's way of making fun of, of kind of um, ridiculing a certain utilitarian uh, moral psychology of his time. Um, the phrase that's one of the kind of starting points for my reflections actually comes from a French writer, uh, Georges Perros. And uh, Perros has a wonderful line, so he's kind of an aphorist. And Perros uh, says, uh, it is true that people go to a lot of trouble in order to be unhappy, but are they? Now, what I like very much about this line is it's a kind of reversal of the classical, let's say, Aristotelian logic, where you would start off from the proposition, and I think this is still quite widespread today in philosophy, in psychology, uh, it's a kind of basic presupposition of economics, of economic science, that human beings are striving to maximize their good, or they're striving to be happy in some sense, in some broad sense. But of course, there's all sorts of conflicts and obstacles along the way that can divert them from the path of happiness, that can knock them away from their real trajectory. And Perros starts off by saying just the opposite. Uh, isn't it true that people go to a lot of trouble in order to be unhappy? They're constantly sabotaging their desires. They're doing things that are against their own interests. They seem to be unhappy uh, all the time. But are they really? Isn't there like a secret happiness that is sort of produced out of this discontent? So this is kind of my starting point for thinking about pleasure and pleasure in a, in a, modern, in a, in a modern sense or a modern context. Now, one of the things I do in the book, and probably the centerpiece, it's really the, the middle chapter, is I try to reread Freud as a philosopher of pleasure. And I say, if you read Freud with a kind of philosophical eye, you can see that in his work, he has a very complex notion of pleasure and unpleasure, of desire, of satisfaction. And in fact, you can see that many of the debates, many of the essential debates in the history of philosophy are actually recapitulated reorganized and rethought in Freud's work. So that there's not just one sort of unitary sense of pleasure and desire in Freud, but there's many different senses, and they're represented by different philosophical positions. So I kind of read Freud as a philosopher of pleasure, where I see sometimes a platonic 
for example, the definition of pleasure, or an Aristotelian, or something closer to St. Thomas, or Nietzsche, for example. So that's kind of the center point of the book, to do a kind of an analysis of the complexity of Freud's own notion of, uh, of uh, pleasure, or of lust. And in fact, I go back to, I try to also do a philosophical history. So I don't do a, it's not a, exactly a rigorous historical study. I don't survey what every, let's say, every philosopher said about pleasure, but I try to distill it to some key moments. And I think you find that even, even today, so in modern debates about the meaning of pleasure, they tend to come back to this seminal debate in ancient philosophy between Plato and Aristotle. You, so they gave two completely opposed definitions of pleasure. And in fact, somehow the, the history of philosophy and also psychoanalysis kind of recapitulates these two definitions. Uh, that philosophers after Plato and Aristotle have either opted for one notion or the other, or they've uh, tried to combine them, or they've developed new ideas from out of these definitions. And they're quite simple. I mean, for Plato, pleasure is the filling of a lack. Human existence is driven by some kind of deficiency or by a kind of irritating surplus. So the striving to reattain a balance that's been destroyed. Pleasure is the filling of a lack. And Aristotle says just the opposite. No, lack is not the important motivating uh, factor in human existence. Pleasure is the enjoyment of an activity. If you enjoy what you're doing, you have pleasure and you become absorbed in the activity and you enjoy it more and more. So for one, it's the filling of a lack and for the other, it's the enjoyment of a activity or of a force or a power that wants to expand itself. So these are the two basic determinations of pleasure in the history of philosophy. Okay. I also try to approach this topic in a, in a fresh way, in a new way, by presenting um, what I consider to be a, a provocative example. I think the best example for thinking about um, what pleasure is and its complexity is complaining. And that's a strange thing. Everybody, everybody knows this, that there are some people um, who really enjoy complaining. And I think even everybody, to some extent, has experienced this in life. And that's a very strange phenomena if you think about it, if you reflect on it. It's not, um, you know, it's not simply a banal occurrence with no meaning. It actually, I think, if if you really reflect deeply on the meaning of complaint in human existence, you can derive sort of all the complexities of pleasure and desire. So, in fact, the book opens with a joke. I'll just recount it quickly. But the book opens with a joke, um, a Jewish joke, so about uh, two guys on the train. Everybody knows this genre. So the two Jews are on the train somewhere in Russia. And the one, um, the one is a younger man, the other is the older man. And the older man is, uh, keeps saying, like, oh, I'm so thirsty. Oi, I'm so thirsty. I'm so thirsty. And he's doing this for a long time. And finally, the, the young man really can't take it anymore, uh, all this complaining. So he goes to the car where they're serving, uh, where they have drinks, and he gets a glass of water and he brings it to the old man. So the old man drinks it down. He looks satisfied. Everything is calm. But he can see a couple minutes later in the old man some kind of tension building up in him. And finally he blurts out, Oi, I was so thirsty. I was so thirsty. Now, I think if you really think about this joke, you could pretty much um, derive everything you need to know about how human desire works. So that's kind of the opening um, gambit. Now, let me say then a few words. So first, I think the book is, is, is about pleasure, about the concepts of pleasure and its complexity. Second, um, it's about complaining. So complaining, and I use complaining in, in a number of different senses. So first, like I said, I think it's a very interesting way into the problem of what pleasure and enjoyment are. Because it's a counterintuitive example. It's, it's interesting that human beings can derive pleasure from something that they manifestly don't like. And that, as you know, Complaining is never exactly matched empirically, uh, let's say, to the level of the annoyance. There's something excessive in complaining. It's not simply that it's, it's somehow in a kind of natural balance with if something is aggravating or annoying, then the complaint matches it. Somehow complaining goes beyond. And even it's a very creative activity also, as you know, so it can find things that are wrong, even if nothing is going wrong. A real complainer can always find some kind of dissatisfaction to feed their complaining drive. Okay, so I think it's an interesting way into that problem. Second, it's a way for me, um, I wanted to also kind of challenge this, this cliched notion we have in philosophy of criticism and critique. 
And I think this really achieves its kind of apex recently with this, what I consider a really terrible word that's sometimes used in philosophical critical circles is criticality. So critique, criticism, what do these mean? And, and I, I feel like complaining is always given a short shrift. It's not a kind of an interesting phenomena to really think about, whereas everybody sort of involved in intellectual life, of course, is interested in criticism and especially critique. But after all, isn't complaining somehow the zero level or the kind of anthropological basis of these more sophisticated activities of criticism and critique? So I also want to kind of at least challenge a certain cliche and idea of what we have a critique and look at, let me say, maybe uh, what we would think of as a more ridiculous, stupid, or less dignified notion. So, complaining. Um, third, it's a way to speak about negativity. So a lot of the book is concerned with the problem of negativity in contemporary thought. So complaining for me is a way to return to this problem again in a kind of um, a fresh way, a kind of fresh perspective on the problem of negativity. And um, fourth, it gives me a way of recharacterizing the two philosophical positions of Lacan and Deleuze. So I use complaining also as a way of trying to summarize, so trying to introduce but also summarize what I think is really at stake in the debate between these two great figures in French philosophy, so Jacques Lacan and Gilles Deleuze. And at one point, you know, I posed the question, well, could we isolate what the ultimate complaint would be? So what would be the pure form of complaining? Could we imagine a complaint such that all other complaints would somehow be simply species or all their complaints would be fragments of this one great complaint. And in fact, I think we can isolate two basic forms of this ultimate complaint. And one refers to um, Lacanian theory and the other to um, Deleuzean philosophy. And I can also say I was very um, struck and very inspired by the fact that in, um, in uh, these interviews that Deleuze made so late in his life, they were actually only released after he, was, uh, after he passed away. So this interview he did with uh, Claire Parnay, it's called the ABCs of, of Gilles Deleuze, the ABC d'air. And it's a really beautiful work. If, you, if, you, if, you, if you're not that familiar with Deleuze, I mean, I can really recommend this as a kind of way into his thought. It's, it's a very charming and kind of wonderful uh, uh, philosophical expose. So for every letter of the alphabet, he gives a short disquisition, so A for animal, for example. Okay. Well, it would actually be B for bet, but okay, French one. Um, in any event, when he talks about joy, so joie, his main example is complaining. Now, that should strike one as very strange because Deleuze is known as the philosopher of affirmation, of becoming, of difference, of multiplicity. And he's very explicitly against negativity. So at one point in this, in this interview, um, Parnay asked him, you know, if you manage to avoid this problem of psychoanalysis, the problem of debt and guilt, if you've spent so much time kind of criticizing the centrality of negativity in philosophy, why are you such a, a partisan of complaining? And Deleuze explains, well, you can't understand anything of poetic creation if you don't have a, a notion, a sense for complaint, that the elegy so like the, the elegy or the, the melancholy plaint, the poem, is the major sort of uh, motivation for poetic expression. So that complaining is linked to creativity for Deleuze. Now, I think these two basic forms of complaining are, for Lacan, Lacan would refer to, the, um, to Oedipus, so to Sophocles, and this great complaint in Oedipus at Colonus, where the chorus says, kind of summarizing all the horror of Greek tragedy, it would be better never to have been born. Better never to, to have been born. The negation of the emergence of nature itself may fool like. So you could say every complaint somehow is faintly, you hear a faint echo, of, it would be better never to be born. And what's interesting in this complaint is it's not only a negation of all that is, but it's an impossible negation. It refers to an impossibility. So it's not just, I would like to die. But it would be better if I, was never, I never was here in the first place. I would have to go back in time for example, and erase my existence, as if I could retroactively negate myself. So there's some kind of an impossibility which actually makes the complaint even more painful. So never to have been born. And Deleuze has a, has a different idea of what I think the great complaint. So he, he calls it the great complaint, the, la grande plainte. So the great complaint. And for him, the basic form of complaining is, this is too much for me. So every time you're complaining, you're somehow saying beneath it, Hey, this is just too much for me. I'm overwhelmed. 
so that it doesn't refer to a kind of negation or it doesn't refer to an impossibility, but it refers to a force that's threatening to overwhelm you and that you can't handle. Every complaint is a reaction to and an expression of an overwhelming power or an overwhelming force. This is too much for me. And you can even see that there could be even two types of complaints. The kind of coping, the complaint that allows you to sort of remap your space, that allows the ego to kind of reassert itself in the face of forces that threaten to overwhelm it. But the more sublime form of complaining is not the one that sort of reasserts the dominance, the control of the ego, but the one that gives itself over to this overwhelming force and makes a kind of song out of it, makes a kind of prayer out of it. That would be the Deleuzian sort of great elegy or great complaint. Uh, uh, that it's not even me who complains, but somehow this song of the complaint that complains itself in and through me, if I could say something like that. Okay, so complaining. Um, the book is also, so on a more academic level, I'm, I, I tried to stage a kind of debate, a dialogue. Uh, I think the better word would actually be encounter between Lacan and Deleuze. Two figures, so these two seminal figures of French thought, who are um, often not, they're not, not only are they not brought together, but they're usually considered um, absolutely opposed. So, um, Let's say being fascinated and influenced by both these figures, I tried to stage a sort of encounter between them in which, uh, let's say, in which neither philosopher, neither thinker is exactly on their home turf. In which, uh, an encounter in which neither figure would exactly be comfortable with what I'm saying. So I think the only point, so for those who study philosophy or are involved in academia, this is a kind of hallowed genre. The, the, everybody should be able to master the genre of uh, compare and contrast. It also shows your, your own mastery of, of thought, to be able to bring disparate sort of bodies to, of thought together and understand what's really at stake in them. I think if there's something valuable in this genre, it's trying to find a way of staging it uh, in such a way that it's not simply a critique of one from the perspective of the other, which I think is an unfortunate, one of the most unfortunate genres of our discipline. So I'm not particularly interested either in a kind of, well, Deleuze could disprove or, or criticize these aspects of Lacan or Lacanian psychoanalysis, nor am I really interested in saying, uh, but Lacanian psychoanalysis can just allow us to pinpoint the kind of weak points or why Deleuze is not interesting. So I, I kind of wanted to take neither position but to try to show what's really, to get something, what's really at stake in their divergence and to somehow stage an encounter again where I brought in other figures, other references that don't necessarily belong to either figure. So that's, that's, that's what I tried to do. Whether it's successful or not, that's for the other to decide, but okay. And um, lastly, I would say that um, uh, uh, what the book is, is really um, trying to develop so, and, and something I'm very interested in is a kind of philosophy of psychopathology. So, you know, why is a philosopher, and this is still very much an open question for me, so why as a philosopher am I interested in psychoanalysis at all? You know, um, what is it that's interesting in psychoanalysis? And, and uh, what can that bring? How can that enrich a kind of philosophical reflection? So that's kind of an open question for me. And that's, very, that's one of the problems that's very much at stake so in the work. And, and I think, you know, just to give a few reflections about that, I mean, I think psychoanalysis is an extremely interesting um, field that emerged in the 20th century, so in the early 20th century. And one of the things that's so interesting about it is it's very hard to identify it. So psychoanalysis insists on its unique identity. It's also a unique practice. So it refuses to be absorbed in another field. It's not, simply, it's not psychology. It's not neurology. It's not, you know, against some American academics. It's not simply literary criticism or it's not just film criticism, you know. It insists on its own identity. On the other hand, psychoanalysis, I think, is one of the most promiscuous um, fields that's ever been invented. So it has its hand in everything. Um, and this is already evident in Freud. So psychoanalysis is interested in, let's say, not just its immediate sort of clinical problems, but it's interested in psychology, it's interested in philosophy, it's interested in classics and literature, in art, visual art, it's interested in law, sociology, theology, neurology, the sciences. It seems to really be, in, it, it seems to spread out over everything. But at the same time, it also withdraws into itself. 
And I think there's something quite interesting in that maneuver. And um, lately, um, uh, what I'm thinking about, I mean, I sort of touch on this in the book, but I don't develop this idea, but that somehow this very notion of being involved in everything, but also being aloof to it, at some moment withdrawing into itself, also kind of mimics um, how to say, the, the, the specific object that psychoanalysis treats. So psychoanalysis will also say it's a specific object. What is the object of psychoanalysis? Is something that Lacan called the objet A, the partial object, the object of desire. And the object of desire is something that somehow is connected to the very constitution of reality, but at the same time retreats into itself and remains utterly enigmatic, aloof. So it's something that is somehow involved in everything, but also withdrawn into itself and indifferent to what is outside of it. So I think somehow psychoanalysis in the field of sciences imitates the very object that it also theorizes. Okay, so if there's one point I think that philosophy and psychoanalysis converge on, uh, or let's say if there's, one, if there's an interesting starting point to try to think of what that dialogue could be, it's the philosophy of psychopathology. So it's what, what does the study of psychopathology, what can that teach us about human existence? And again, I think where Freud is very radical and, that, and, that, and to this day, so that's still a living debate, let's say, is that um, for Freudian psychoanalysis, there is no such thing as a normal human being. So the notion of pathology actually ends up uh, swallowing the, the, the idea of the norm. Uh, or put differently, when Freud identifies different psychopathologies, and also what's interesting in, in classic psychoanalysis is there's not so many pathologies. So if you look at contemporary psychiatry, there's literally hundreds of categories, hundreds of different. In, it's much simpler. There's essentially a threefold uh, division, and then with some subdivisions. But it's a much simpler diagnostic. But it's a, in some ways a much more powerful diagnostic because it tries to look at you know really structural differences between how human existence is lived. So. When Freud talks about, for example, hysteria, or, or perversion, or psychosis, these aren't just sicknesses, but these are actually ways of being human. That's the point. <coughs> that these different psychopathologies are not just some negative kind of maladies, sicknesses, uh, things one suffers from and one tries to cure oneself of. They're actually positive ways uh, of being human. And in fact, there are no other ways. So that would be the strong claim in psychoanalysis, that the psychopathologies describe the essential structures of subjectivity, and that uh, psychopathology is a kind of window onto basics of problems, crises, conflicts that afflict everybody. And depending on which conflicts, crises, uh, problems obsess you more, you will be you will fall under one category or the other. But these are universally shared problems. They're not simply the result of accidental damage to a normal development. So I, very, I try to so develop this idea from Freud, defend it. I think this is, a, this is a, uh, one of the most inspiring sort of ideas one can take uh, out of Freud, this kind of radical uh, criticism of the notion of the normal in the field of, of psychology, psychiatry. And then I show how both um, Lacan and Deleuze adhere to this, but they adhere to it in different ways. And then it becomes interesting for me that there's different ways of trying to think of, let's say, um, the pathology of human existence or the pathoanalysis, let's say, of, of, of human existence. And um, maybe just to summarize, so just to end on that point, uh, you could say maybe broadly speaking, there's kind of two ways of understanding this idea that the human being is a sick animal. Sick by its very nature. Not sick because of accidental crises, conflicts, but somehow there's a kind of structural, if you want, defect or structural problem uh, that, that we can only cope with in different ways. I think this has been understood broadly in, in two ways in, in the history. Um, um, and this stretches even back before uh, the 20th century, but okay. If I can articulate two paradigms. One would be, I, I would call a classical paradigm, in which you would say the human being is kind of um, torn apart by certain fundamental conflicts um, that uh, it can only cope with in different ways, better or worse. Okay, there's a kind of fundamental conflict. Uh, the way Freud described that is, it's human existence is a kind of rigged game. 
if you read Civilization and Discontents, that there's a kind of inherent dissatisfaction of life. So you could say the game is rigged against you. Um, Deleuze and Guattari would say something um, very different. It's not that there's a rigged game, but the game is wide open and unpredictable. You can't say that there's a kind of there's a kind of cheat at the beginning, but it's kind of wide open and unpredictable. And this is a more romantic approach as opposed to a classical one. In the romantic approach, you can say the human being is filled with sort of forces, desires, and so forth, but they tend to be too much for it, and therefore uh, it tends to react against those forces in such a way that it closes them off, represses them, um, finds a way of living with them that actually creates. Uh, more trouble, more dissatisfaction, and so forth. So in a classical theory, one starts with a kind of fundamental conflict. You try to define what that conflict is and look at the different kinds of defenses against that conflict. And in the romantic theory, you begin with the idea of nature being kind of full of a creative but overwhelming power that then is so powerful, so overwhelming, it tends to alienate itself from itself. Okay. So these are the kind of two paradigms I explore. But then you can see the very interesting crossing points between them. Because for Freud, and especially for Lacan, it wouldn't be enough simply to say that the game is rigged against us. Because there's always something that sort of uh, skews or tweaks, breaks this kind of problem of the rigged game. So there's something that doesn't obey by the rules of the game. And that some, certain something would be precisely the object of desire, the object of satisfaction. It's something that somehow escapes out of the rigged game. And for Deleuze and Guattari, you could also say that, OK, the game is, as they would say, wide open and unpredictable. You should affirm the, the chance, for example. Um, um, but for them, then they have to explain precisely what I was saying, how it is that that, that pure chance, this, this kind of aleatory movement of drives and so forth, tends to become alienated from itself and produces okay, all these psychopathologies and so forth. Let me end on, uh, again, on, this, on, on one further point that I think one of the interesting uh, consequences, if one takes seriously this idea um, that one cannot positively define any kind of norm for human life. You can positively define uh, the object of desire or, or, or happiness. So if one takes this seriously, um, then we're left with a kind of um, interesting task, which is to say, um, from a therapeutic standpoint, it's not, the question is not then, how does one cure oneself from your neurosis? or how does one escape from your perversion? Or how do you uh, somehow you know, uh, conquer the madness? But to actually find some kind of redeeming element, some kind of great element within those different pathologies. So there's something actually um, creative, interesting, uh, productive, uh, let's say, daring or, or, or sublime in neurosis or in perversion or in psychosis. And if you look at the different philosophers then, you can see that the really great works on psychopathology have always been, so writers, who've taken one or the other pathology hmm, and kind of have become a partisan of that pathology. So try to sort of uh, argue for that pathology against the others. If you see Deleuze in philosophy, Deleuze and Guattari are severe critics of neurotics. Um, that's a problem for me and for most of you, most people who are neurotics. Um, so there's a certain undercurrent in the book um, that's not so explicitly theorized, but there's a certain undercurrent when I start when I'm suggesting that there's also kind of something interesting in, in neurosis, you know. But there are severe critics of neurotics, for example, and in a certain uh, middle period, Deleuze was writing very interesting texts about perversion and then later um, schizophrenia. Um, Lacan, you could say, is a kind of champion of hysteria, for instance. Um, against perversion and so forth. Now, on a certain level, I would say one, one is kind of morally neutral. I mean, one should be morally neutral. Um, that it's not one pathology somehow better, not one type is not somehow better than the other. But in a strange way, like the philosophy of art, um, one only really makes an advance in this field by being a, somehow a partisan. So by taking a position. So also, one doesn't really produce very interesting um, observations on the philosophy of the art by saying, well, you know, all artworks are different. They're all kind of wonderful. And let's try to, let's try. You, I mean, usually you analyze by starting with specific artworks or artists. And those become somehow emblematic 
for some universal claims about what you think the notion of art is, how it can be critical or not, why it's interesting, how it responds, etc., etc. And I think this also occurs, um, that's also an interesting way of looking at how the writing of psychopathology happens in the great works on psychopathology. So, okay, maybe I end. Uh, I end there and open it for conver for conversation. Is that? Yeah, that's about a half hour. Good. Thank you, Aaron. So uh, we'll proceed to to say it in advance. Uh, both me and uh, Ante will have. Each of us two questions. Okay. So it, all, all, in total, four questions for Aaron. Uh, maybe some sub questions, but uh, we also shall then uh, leave some space for uh, for you to uh, to intervene. Um, let's say my opening question, also a remark. Uh, it is uh, really very seldom or rare that one uh, reads uh, a book, a text, uh, with such a pleasure and. Uh, as always, with the pleasure, or most at least, with, the, with our cliche of or conception of a pleasure that it, it should be interminable and should last forever. Um, at some point, I asked myself, OK, this is so full of pleasure. This is uh, just I would like to go on reading, reading, reading. But then um, a suspicion arose, and um, my, my kind of complaint. Um, in a way, ask myself um, something like, and I would say, uh, Aaron today had a comment which, I mean, since this has been recorded, uh, I shall, of course, I should uh, obscenely uh, reproduce it, that uh, probably since the sublime object of ideology and with its publication in English, nothing of, its, of that quality has appeared on the subject like Aaron's book. So I, I guess, endorse this. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say this is, uh, as you will see, uh, uh, unlike uh, with the context of the book, again, coming more to, this, let's say, the sociological or the fashion part, where, uh, where we have been uh, so much uh, accustomed to uh, <clears throat> specific epigons of um, Slovene discourse. Um, Again, I would say that is uh, a really, uh, uh, as, it, as the author promises, really something new and fresh. But again, coming to the thing which I was, I was then uh, asking myself, uh, but if the book is so successful in explaining everything, and this everything means from Sophocles to, to 21st century, and if it's a geography of references is really great, it's, uh, uh, it's also plurilingual in a sense, it's open to, to divergent experiences. I ask myself, but what's not in the book? Or in a way, does the book explain everything? Is it uh, for all occasions? Is it in a way an uh, all-purpose tool? And um, I tried somehow to figure out what would be the, uh, for at least in my understanding of, the, of your argumentation, what would be the basic link of the bond uh, or the machinery of the or the apparatus of the of, of your of your argumentation, and then notwithstanding uh, the different references and the basic point that uh, it is a book, let's say basically it is a book about um, encounter, likely or unlikely encounter of Gilles Deleuze and uh, Jacques Lacan. But that basically, it is a book about a bond, or still, it is a book written in a way with the assumption that the bond of psychoanalysis and philosophy, or philosophy and psychoanalysis, is still the best, or the privileged, or the most powerful access, and also that it is the, on the other side, that it is the, 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 the most powerful uh, creative tool uh, to, um, to either to access, to have access to experience or to create experience, which will uh, tell us uh, most about what human life and, um, and its world is. So in a way, I, I, uh, in the 20th century, as all of you will know, uh, for example, Martin Heidegger's philosophy was always criticized that Heidegger's philosophy basically would be a bond uh, or privileged bond of philosophy and poetry. Now, in your account, mm. it is still uh, philosophy and psychoanalysis, or psychoanalysis and philosophy. So asking myself, is this this blind spot in a way of, 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 of your argumentation? Well, let's say that you still privilege 
or why do you still privilege, maybe in an accusatory term, why do you still privilege this bond of philosophy and, and psychoanalysis? Uh, unlike, let's say, taking any other bond we could think of, any other human activities taken together of different domains, why is it still a philosophy and psychoanalysis? Uh, I mean, just to recall, uh, also a couple of years ago, we had here uh, Barbara Kassan, for example, Barbara Kassan, also in her interpretation of Lacan. Uh, what she has done, for example, mm. Kassan has prominently uh, um, then uh, written about the bond of, let's say, a bit less glorious bond than philosophy and psychoanalysis. And Kassan makes a point of combining, joining psychoanalysis with sophistry. Uh, so it is less about Aristotle and Plato, though it is, of course, also about them. But maybe, let's, let's say, uh, why not, for example, psychoanalysis and medicine? Or, again, coming to terms with philosophy and other things. So it's, just mm. again, so it's the question, okay. why, still, why still do you think that even for 21st century this would be the privilege bond or access to, to, to know what and to define what human experience is? Okay, well, first of all, you know, there are plenty of limitations in the book. You'll, you'll see them. If you read the book, I mean, there's plenty of limitations in the, in the analysis and there's, and there's also, I mean, plenty of things left unsaid. So, um, but okay. Um, you know, again, why psychoanalysis? I mean, I can, I, you know, I can kind of repeat um, my argument from before that, I mean, the, the lesson or what I, the kind of shocking insight of psychoanalysis and that I think, again, is absolutely relevant today, I mean, in, the, in contemporary conditions, is this uh, project of the uh, criticism of the normal. And I think psychoanalysis emerged as one of the most powerful sort of critiques of normality in 20th century thought. Um, but also kind of, let's say, one of the most interesting ones because if you look at the history of psychoanalysis, it's as if um, other figures, including Freud himself, so Freud is a kind of complex writer, that this idea of, uh, of uh, that the, the, somehow the human being, the human animal, is prey to all these pathologies without being able to define so a strong normative sense of, of life or health, um, that Freud himself tends to react against this idea and sometimes gives hints towards a more sort of normative developmental psychology that exists within Freud. And different psychoanalytic authors have actually reinterpreted Freud in strongly normative terms. So that this is actually a controversy within psychoanalysis, and I think it's a controversy that philosophy can also take up and with its own resources enter into a dialogue with. So that's kind of one of my fundamental interests. That's also why, so just one other point, why, you know, I, I also went back to what's probably one of the most notorious, and let's say notoriously awful books of the 20th century, Anti-Oedipus. Um, I think that's a quite interesting book. Uh, and I think it's quite interesting to try to read it in a very sober way. So to treat it not as if it was some kind of revolutionary tract, a kind of amazing sort of poetical um, exploration of the unconscious of capitalism, of, of universal history and so forth, but actually to treat it as if it was a very dry, um, boring philosophical treatise on the level of Kant, for instance, to try to see what it also has to say about um, psychopathology. And I think it has some very interesting insights, and it's not simply a romanticization of madness, which is something that the Deleuze and Guattari often uh, criticize for. So, you know, to answer you simply, that, that's kind of the central core, how I start. And I even sort of launch, I think in the introduction, like, pose the question, well, what is the relationship between philosophy and psychoanalysis? If I can't really give an answer to that, or a rigorous answer, if I can't fully answer, at least I can pose another question, which is, what is the, what is the study of psychopathology tell us about the human condition? So in a sense, I raise a question. I can't really answer it, but OK. And then move to another question that I think can be dealt with more. But OK, that's the, that's the best I can do. Okay, and then, okay, just uh, and then again, and the other clarification. Question? But again, I mean, uh, it, it, uh, it would be, again, I mean, it's not just per se psychoanalysis or then philosophy. I mean, you, you, you now just told that, uh, uh, let's say, which is fine, that uh, psychoanalysis in this normative sense is uh, for you in this new normative sense uh, is, uh, is intriguing for you. But again, why still this bond of, uh, of philosophy and psychoanalysis and nothing, let's say, it could be for philosophy, it could be in, in the two and a half uh, millennia. It, there had been 
other privileged interlocutors for f philosophers, uh, let's say other domains, arts, Correct. let's say, and so on, politics could be, and also for psychoanalysis within the uh, hundred and so years of its, uh, since its invention, also had been other interlocutors. But why still? I mean, why still this privileged bond of... Well, philosophy? I mean, look, I can give a very dissatisfying answer, which is that I have nothing against people doing philosophy in art or philosophy in mathematics, so you know, why not to do philosophy in psychoanalysis? I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to justify that as if I'm doing the only thing you should do. I mean, so I can give a very dissatisfying answer, but you know, if I could, if I could say one other thing um, that I was just thinking while you were speaking is that you know this notion of this kind of let's say radical criticism of normality. It's easier said than done, and I think that's also um, an important lesson. So there's also kind of a nice quip uh, of Lacan. So Lacan was was very good for his. Uh, clever turns of phrase and at one point in one of his seminars you know he tells his audience you know people are always asking me why don't you talk about normal desire why don't you talk about normal desire and he says well you know um, I always talk about normal desire there's actually three kinds neurotic psychotic and perverse so you know but you can say that but it's another thing to actually develop that idea and articulate it. And of course, one of the criticisms that comes, one of the strong criticisms that's coming from Deleuze, that's why it's interesting to maybe stage that encounter, is to say that Lacanian, well, psychoanalysis may be Lacanian psychoanalysis, it's a complex question, actually is much more normative than it thinks it is. It ends up reintroducing a kind of normativity and reintroduces an idea of a normal development, even when it says it doesn't do it. So then the question, well, are they right? Are they not? That's what the whole debate about the Oedipus complex has to do with. That's the severe criticism coming in 1972, that actually psychoanalysis reintroduces a very normative conception of what a human being is. Well, you have to pass through the Oedipus complex. You have to accept the name of the father and so forth. Now, I'm not saying that's a very good reading of Lacan. There's a, good, there's a response that can come from Lacan. But I'm just saying it shows how controversial difficult that issue is. So sometimes it can sound very easy. Well, there's no, there's no normality. Wonderful. Uh, not so wonderful. It's, it's, a, it's a very difficult. It's, it's easy to say, difficult to actually really uh, understand the implications to really work that out in a theoretically sort of satisfying, rigorous way. Um, hmm. Uh, well, uh, I'll start my response by pointing to the axiom of a whole tradition uh, which you are on uh, masterfully traces uh, from Plato to Leopardi and beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, one can only desire to have one, uh, what one does not have. So the logic of desire is the logic of lack and this uh, logic of lack uh, persists to this day. Uh, like, while neither Freud nor Lacan thinks that desire can be fulfilled, uh, so this is textbook Lacan, mm -hmm. they assume uh, that the aim of desire is uh, absolute fulfillment and the lack of such fulfillment accounts for the relentless movement on desire, namely the impossibility of desire coming to an end in the experience of fulfillment. As Freud puts it in the Beyond the Pleasure Principle, in an argument that anticipates the, the Lacanian notion, that's not it, uh, as the law of desire. Mm. It is the uh, difference between the pleasure of satisfaction that is demanded uh, and that which is actually achieved that provides the driving factor uh, which will permit of no halting at any position uh, uh, attained. The reason uh, we keep going, the reason we never come to rest, is thus uh, because we never arrive at desired destination. Uh, throughout the, uh, your book, uh, you have persuasively argued that the logic of the lack presented in this way does not go give full justice uh, to the richness of uh, psychoanalytical mm. account of the relation between desire and pleasure. One of the modalities in which you, the, two, uh, the two terms can be knotted together is the so-called uh, harmonious harmony, where desire is completely filled at every moment, yet without ceasing to be desire. For my part, I can uh, only say that I've enjoyed while reading your book in precisely this manner. So I thought this is it, while simultaneously wanting more and more, encore, encore. So uh, upon uh, recollect uh, recollecting my impressions for this occasion, I decided to ask you questions which highlight uh, the ideas in your work I found most, more, more interesting, the most interesting uh, from 
purely idiosyncratic personal reasons. Okay. So uh, I'll pose my first question by, uh, 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 by citing uh, Balzac uh, lo from Lost Illusions, which is also one of your references. The cruelty we can forgive. Those who hurt us uh, uh, must have still some faith in us, but indifference. Indifference is like polar snow. It, it distinguishes all life. At one point in your book, you suggest the problem of indifference as a problem of a paramount importance, our generational problem which expresses a generalized disorientation and malaise that is flip side of empty celebration of differences. Then you give a glimpse of what uh, would the Lacanian account of difference would look like, and you say that Deleuze, uh, Deleuze stands close to the account on this point. You go so far to suggest that the proper title of the last book uh, should be Indifference and Repetition. Uh, is there in the last or Lacan a concept of difference or indifference is still waiting to be raised to the dignity of the concept? Right. No, thank you very much. I mean, you, you pointed sort of um, um, something I was working on quite a bit. So this, this idea, I tried to introduce a notion of indifference as opposed to to difference. And I also indeed have a kind of bad joke that if we really want to understand, I think, what was at stake in Deleuze's notion of difference, um, again, to fight against a certain cliched reception of Deleuze, that Deleuze is often understood as a kind of celebration of differences in the sense of kind of a pluralism. That every, you know, everything, everybody is a little bit different and these differences all contribute somehow to the richness of being. That the differences, the real differences he's interested in, when he talks about pure difference or difference in itself, should better be expressed with the idea of indifference. So Deleuze has a very odd concept. He asks you to imagine that one thing would differ, but not the other thing differing in return. So normally, our normal conception of difference is a kind of reciprocal relationship. You know, A differs from B insofar as B differs from A. But could you imagine A differing from B and B, let's say, to put it more in very colloquial language, B just not caring, turning its back. Um, in sense, one element is not returning, but one element is indifferent to the other element. For, so that something emerges, and the kind of beautiful example he gives is like a lightning bolt, uh, you know, emerges is a kind of a minimal kind of idea of a surface ground distinction, or, or figure, sorry, figure ground distinction. So a lightning bolt against the black sky, it sort of differentiates itself, but the black sky retreats into it. The, the blackness of the night simply retreats into itself. It doesn't reach back in some way to the lightning. So this idea of there's a kind of indifferent ground of difference, kind of um, abyssal ground. And I think, so I try to bring this idea of indifference to show that the Deleuze's idea of difference is far from being a kind of, I don't know, harmonious celebration of kind of pluralism, multiplicity and so forth, that there's a real kind of violence um, and a real kind of shock implied with um, encountering a, a real difference, for example, that, that it's actually an encounter with something you don't recognize. So something that's sort of indifferent um, to the subject that would try to say, name it or, or place it. Now, in the, in the case of Lacan, um, when Lacan, so there's a, there's a part of the book where I spend some time trying to disentangle um, one of the trickier notions of Lacan, something that he um, introduces in the seventh seminar when he tries to understand what is the real object of desire, and he calls it the thing. Okay, I won't go into the, all the depth and kind of richness of this idea of the thing, but I think what's, what's interesting in the Lacanian perspective, I mean, to put it very, to put it, you know, in the simplest terms I can, is that usually we think of this idea of desire as lack, as we're missing the object that we want. But I think lack has to be understood in a kind of, in another sense, in an opposite sense. So it's not that lack is that object over there that I'm aiming for, but what's lacking is the very ground from which I could desire something. So the problem of Lacanian psychoanalysis is not I'm always missing, I'm always dissatisfied, I'm always looking for something that doesn't exist, I'm always looking for the mother, of course the mother is prohibited to me. And I can, okay. It's not that I'm always looking for a kind of enjoyment that, that can't be found, but the more fundamental problem is how do I even start desiring in the first place? We can't even take desire for granted. We have to learn how to desire in some sense. 
And uh, the ground, if we want to think the ground of desire, from where am I desiring? That position is one of deep confusion and disorientation. And I think that's what the thing names. So I argue that the thing is characterized by three characteristics, the kind of emptiness, um, <laughs> ah, emptiness, indifference, and a kind of arbitrariness or a disorientation, if you want. And that indifference, and I think this is a very interesting perspective of Lacan, that again, like the Balzac quote um, that you mentioned, that, that, uh, the Balzac quote, that indifference is the true terror. Um, not hatred. And in some sense, hatred is already a kind of softening of the indifference from which I'm completely excluded. If God hates me, for instance, then I still have a place in the world. If God is simply indifferent, I'm simply thrown out of the world entirely. I have no footing to stand on. So that even fantasies of like, uh, even fantasies of like, uh, as Lacan would say, even these fantasies you find like in Melanie Klein and this idea of the, the terrible sort of maternal relation is already a way of kind of reimagining maybe a fundamental indifference that exists in human relations. So that, that indifference becomes a, a, a very kind of important, interesting category that, that the indifference um, names um, this ground of desire that, that, can't be, uh, that can't be recognized and sometimes emerges and emerges in moments that are quite terrible or terrifying or full of anxiety. Um, so for instance, and then I'll, I'll end with this, but to give you know, one example, I mentioned the book that's a beautiful description by uh, Mandelstam. And he, and he says, you know, what really terrifies us in a madman? Or what, what's the really most terrifying thing in, in another human being? And you can really tell a madman, so psychotic, the way that they, they, their eyes fix on you, but without looking at you. The way that they speak to you, but without any interest in what you could possibly respond. So that somehow there's something that you can't escape from, but is utterly indifferent to you that there's something cold and it retreats away. So I tried to give a rather long description of this idea that there's something in these objects that actually doesn't involve you, as something that retreats away from you. The other term I use for that is narcissism. Narcissism not in terms of the usual sense, that the person who loves themselves, that looks in the mirror, for instance, but the narcissism of something that retreats into itself and is therefore indifferent to things outside. So it's a kind of narcissism um, not of the mirror image or not of the ego, but there's a narcissism, I think, of the drive, I would call it. And that's a narcissism that is based on kind of a self-withdrawal and that excludes. So I think that's a kind of important aspect of Lacan's understanding of the dynamics of desire. It's a problem of indifference. Okay. So that was a bit of a long answer. And the, did you have one other question? No, now coming to my second okay. question. Oh, okay. So we have a, two, a B, A, B. Oh. <laughs> oh, B, A, B, A. Uh, I can't keep track. Let's say one of the things uh, reading the book was um, uh, Staging, I would say, I mean, um, you've uh, put it nicely. So it, it is about the staging, also a dialogue or encounter, uh, theater of philosophy in a, in a way or thinking. Um, interestingly enough, in a book, a uh, major figure is just a minor one, and this is Michel Foucault. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, uh, as the book was already in the printing, sent in the printing press last year, you, 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 have, you have given uh, a paper in Beirut on uh, Lacan and Foucault, which is, let's say, goes now beyond the, uh, this, uh, this very book. But as, um, let's say, for, for Deleuze and, and, and Lacan, you had, in a way, to speculate about the relationship, or at least the, the actual relationship, from what we know of, of Foucault and Deleuze, that exactly the point of the difference, how they define what desire and pleasure, that it was at least from, uh, from uh, uh, hearsay, that it was, uh, and then also the different uh, strategies of uh, resistance and also of, of politics, that it was one of the, those big breakups within the 20th century intellectual uh, landscape. Recalling again that it was exactly uh, Michel Foucault who, who once pronounced that the 21st century will be known as the Deleuzian one. Uh, 
that, actually, that this point, exactly this point, I mean, you have it in the book, so I have those pronouncements by, uh, both by um, Deleuze and, and Foucault, but actually their encounter and their deep friendship and then deep hatred or indifference is almost somehow put aside. But in a, coming again mm. back to, to your Lacan Foucault paper, uh, could you in a way, I mean, explicate uh, or in a way enlarge the stage? So not just Deleuze and, Foucault and uh, Lacan or Lacan and Foucault, but Deleuze, Foucault, Lacan. Right. You know, could you do something like yes, this for us? Things, of course, get very, very complicated because um, um, this is something I, I mentioned that I'm also quite interested in, like the uh, the philosophy of desire. Let's say that was quite central in French philosophy in the 60s and 70s. So this idea of desire being let's say, the fundamental concept. Let's start philosophizing with the notion of desire. But then you see that there was immediately kind of a terminological, great terminological confusion and a kind of a battle. So you know you have um, Deleuze who says at one point, you know, pleasure is a terrible word. Let's just drop it. It always refers to lack. It's polluted by a kind of platonic legacy. Let's talk about desire. And then you have Foucault saying, desire is a terrible concept. Desire is useless. It's also linked, to, for the same reason, desire is linked with lack. It's linked with a kind of psychoanalytic hermeneutics. It's linked with the problematic of confession. Why don't we go back to pleasure? Pleasure is an interesting concept. And then, of course, you have Lacan who would say, no, in a certain sense, I would more agree with Deleuze. Pleasure is not so interesting because we have to make a distinction between pleasure and enjoyment or results. So you, you could really have this kind of idea that there's a tremendous confusion and a kind of battle between who has the best sort of voluptuous um, term. And part of, the, part of the way I parse this or go back is I say, well, in fact, I'll use the word pleasure. Um, the, the more common term, but I w want to give a sort of grounding this debate again in Greek philosophy, but not the way Foucault does it. So it's not so much about practices, let's say, of self-creation, but but about the kind of debate about what pleasure is in ancient philosophy. So I, it's a one way that I kind of um, sidestep in a certain way the debate by trying to introduce okay a new way of, of giving sense to these terms. But the other thing that's quite interesting, so I don't discuss Foucault in the book because okay, there has to be limits. Um, there has to be limits in life. Uh, <laughs> basic lesson of psychoanalysis. Uh, but one of the things that's interesting is that um, Foucault and Deleuze both seem to have a sort of parallel um, relationship um, to psychoanalysis. And it's, it's, it's a somewhat funny one um, from, from an outside view. I mean, at one moment, they are both let's say there's some kind of love affair with psychoanalysis, there's a great enthusiasm, as if psychoanalysis, as if they were allies with psychoanalysis. You can see that in Deleuze's books, Difference and Repetition and Logic of Sense. You can see that in Foucault's book, The Order of Things, that psychoanalysis has really a privileged role in their own philosophical projects. Then they become deeply critical of psychoanalysis, um, a real polemical attack, for example, anti-Oedipus in the history of sexuality. And then you could say in the later work, they become more indifferent, serene. Okay, psychoanalysis does its thing, I'm going to do my thing. So you could say that they both sort of go through the very classic um, steps of any romantic relationships, love, hatred, indifference. Um, and so that was one of my kind of questions, you know, what is the relationship to philosophy and psychoanalysis more generally? Is it one of these three categories or is that kind of the starting place for thinking, like why is that such a difficult um, relationship? But there is sort of a funny parallelism. Um, between the, the ways the, in which those positions develop, both in Deleuze and in, in, in uh, Foucault. But that's all I can say for now, but it's true. I'm also, um, or maybe I can say one other thing, that I think Foucault is a much more radical critic of psychoanalysis. So, you know, um, even you could have the impression it's the opposite, that, that Anti-Oedipus seems to be one of the most harsh sort of anti-psychoanalytic books, but it's really not true. I mean, they retain a lot from psychoanalysis. They retain the same uh, diagnostic categories, so neurosis, perversion, psychosis, and they retain the notion of repression. They have an idea of, you know, the whole problem is why, um, you know, this question is repeated throughout the book, why is it that people uh, desire their own repression? Why do the masses want fascism? Why do people sort of strive for their own unhappiness and claim it as a kind of positive desire? So they have a very strong notion of repression, whereas Foucault said, forget repression. This is a red herring. We need a completely new sort of theoretical framework. So I think actually Foucault was involved in a much more radical rejection of psychoanalysis um, um, 
uh, than Toulouse and Guattari. Although, even Foucault comes back to Lacan later in his career, you can see. So, so uh, I would like to uh, end my response mm. on a lighter note. Uh, and on the question of uh, philosophical bestiary. So the question of philosophical bestiary is certainly a convoluted one. Hegel invoked the owl uh, to highlight the mm. fact that philosophy takes flight only at the end of the day, after the day main events uh, have taken place. Marx, as Mladen Dollar recently reminded us, opposed uh, Hegel's owl to French rooster, the French national symbol and the emblem of French Revolution, mm. the morning bird, announcing the dawn. Nietzsche, yet again, wouldn't uh, be confined to this choice, so he proposed a whole zoo, a lion, an eagle, a camel, snake, etc. Of course, Deleuze, a great zoologist himself, uh, among other animals, introduced the tick into philosophy. Right. Uh, the animal that uh, sticks to the surface. Right, the affect, the one so, affect of the uh, tick, yes. So I'm interested in your bestiary, Aaron. Mm. I was happy to find that you uh, confine it to domestic animals, uh, pets actually. Uh, you take the cat and the dog as a classic impossible couple of animal kingdom in order to provide a different, original, L quite brilliant uh, take on uh, one of the, the less, most famous concept that is becoming an animal. So. Right. Well, thanks a lot for this question because I have to say, so there is, a, I do have a line in this book on cats and dogs and uh, I have to say I'm working on this um, currently, expanding this. I'm very interested in this, what I consider to be an unfortunately neglected problem in the history of philosophy, the relationship of the cat and the dog. And uh, indeed, I, I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, I really hadn't thought of it that way until you mentioned it, but I guess it is a kind of bestiary. And if I could kind of defend my bestiary, in a sense, why I think it's the best, is um, I think it's, it's uh, I think I actually take a proper, a really properly modernist approach, which is not, so often when philosophers become interested in animals, it's usually the most exotic animals somehow, or even imaginary animals. I think one of the most wonderful books on that actually is from Willem Flusser, his book on the um, uh, Vampiro Toitis Infernalis, so he talks about the deep sea squid, you know? So they, philosophers tend to talk about sort of exotic animals or imaginary animals. Or the animal somehow has something much more attractive or sexy than human being, the animal becoming the wolf or something. As Deleuze says, you know, the, the most pitiful cry of the animal kingdom is the dog, bow wow. Okay. So I actually think we should, you know, as proper modernists, the really interesting procedure is to try to find the extraordinary in the ordinary. So I'm interested in the most banal animals there are, the pet dog and the pet cat. So not even wild animals, but I'm interested in dogs and cats. Um, and I think that there's a lot to be said there. And in fact, it, it, the way I set it up in the book, I, I mean, one of the chapters starts with um, a hunger artist, Kafka's story, Franz Kafka's story, The Hunger Artist, which of course ends with this image of a panther, of this kind of cat. And then I end that chapter with a discussion of a kind of relatively unknown uh, passage in, in Sartre's uh, great book on Flaubert, where he talks about a pet dog. And I'm more and more convinced, actually, that the, the um, cat and the dog, and I also think maybe this is why these animals are so appealing to human beings, and why human beings tend to split into dog people and cat people, is because each of these animals somehow embodies um, one of the essential vectors of uh, subjectivation. So that I think these animals um, together, they embody, let's say, the two fundamental vectors of subjectivation. And I'm happy to say that now I'm writing, um, so my next book, I'm currently working on a short book which is devoted to just to one um, story of Kafka, Investigations of a Dog. And if I can uh, just elaborate this a little bit more, I was happy to discover that the, the one thinker I found who's really devoted some uh, reflections since poem of the cat and the dog is uh, Rilke. So Rilke, in a preface to um, a very young Baltus, I think he was maybe uh, not even a teenager, 
very young Balthus, uh, before he was a painter, you know, uh, made a series of cat drawings. I guess his cat Mitsu um, ran away or something, and he made all these cat drawings. They're very cute. And he collected them together as a book, and Rilke wrote a preface for it. So this is what, is, this is what it means to have a privileged childhood, to have Rilke write a preface for your childhood cat drawings. Um, but Rilke makes an interesting observation. Uh, and just to, to summarize that, there's something deeply tragic about a dog, because the pathos of the dog is the kind of transition between nature and culture. That the dog is somehow trying to overcome its nature, its natural milieu and its instincts, and enter into kind of human culture, which it fundamentally somehow worships and adores. So the dog is also a figure of authority and of training. Um, whereas a cat, even though a cat might be more somehow friendly or cuddly or whatnot, um, cats fundamentally retreat into themselves and are aloof creatures. So no matter how um, warm you think your relationship is to a cat, at a certain level, you don't know what the cat is thinking. And the cat sort of embodies something that's just wholly other, that, that can't be sublated, let's say, within a cultural dialectic, or doesn't um, have a place within the cultural universe, but fundamentally disrupts it. It somehow stands for something that can't be absorbed into the human universe, whereas a dog somehow is the striving, the striving um, to enter into culture. And of course, the point isn't that the human being has a kind of cultural existence that the cat and dog doesn't, but the human being fundamentally is torn between or product of these two basic vectors of entering into culture, but never, let's say, succeeding, or never being fully, let's say, a cultural being, or never finding uh, its sure place within culture, but also being haunted by this kind of other that can never master and that somehow retreats into itself this kind of indifferent ground of its own desiring. So I'm very fascinated by, indeed, the cat and the dog as somehow emblems of subjectivity. So indeed, um, I'm very glad you sort of mentioned this. Maybe that would count as some kind of a bestiary. But I'm, I'm trying to look into this further, precisely with Kafka's story of, of a dog, of a dog as a kind of philosopher right now.